is this, so if we know our reflection coefficient, we can know z. We could just keep plugging this in over there. But what we can do is we can find out that, for example, if this value is 1, if gamma, if, 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 the, if, the, if the impedance, z, r plus jx, and for example, I set r equal to 0, and I varied x up and down, like this, I would get a circle like so on, on, the, on, the, on, on the reflection plane. So my reflection coefficient would have to lie somewhere on the circle. And the value of this guy here would be the value of the reflection coefficient always has to have a value of 1, right? Because if the real part is going to be 0, you're never going to be able to dissipate any power in the load. So what, whatever goes out has to come back. Right? So that means that this outside edge of the Smith, the outside edge of the Smith chart is the, is the value for the magnitude equal to 1. Okay? So that's this guy here is this outside edge is the reflection coefficient equal to 1. So to measure the length of the reflection coefficient, is you take this length here and you compare it to that length there. That ratio is the magnitude of the reflection coefficient. Okay. Now, the angle is that they do is on the Smith chart is they label degrees around here. So you can measure the angle by just taking the line and extending it, and you can measure the angle. Okay. So now, the value, if you value this equal to, if the real part was equal to 1, and you vary jx up and down, you would get a circle, not a very good circle. It looks like this. And you can see this is the place where x equals 0. The reflection coefficient goes to 0 at this point here. All right. The imaginary parts is this is the value for the imaginary part. This is that now if you sit there and you vary r, that's this line here. Okay. If you value r, and move this to 1, that's this line. You vary r and move this to minus 1, that's that line there. Okay? So it's going to take a little bit of getting used to. I don't expect people to get it right away of what you remember. You're always on the reflection plane. You just have this cheat, you just think of the Smith chart. It's a cheat sheet to tell you what the impedance is. But you're always on the reflection plane. Because a lot of people will try to sit there and say, you know, I'm plotting my impedance. You can't plot your impedance. You're plotting the reflection coefficient. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to the next example. Now, when we're going to do a matching network, we can always add stuff in series. So you understood basically adding stuff in series. So, so impedance goes V is equal to Z. Uh, the, you know, if you had two impedances you wanted to add in series, you just add them up, right? So a, a matching network has to be a combination of elements series and parallel. So for example, if you have something that's equal to 100 ohms, okay, you got to add something in parallel to bring it down to 50 ohms. So you can't just do series stuff. So impedance is not very well uh, set up for working in parallel configurations because the impedance is just basically given 1 over ZL is equal to 1 over Z1 plus 1 over Z2. That's not a very easy way of working. However, so if you're going to work with loads in parallel, the best way to work with is to work with admittance. Admittance, I is equal to YV compared to V equals to ZI. Y is just 1 over Z. And so when you put two things in parallel, you just add the admittances together. So depending on what we're going to do, we're going to go into the impedance Smith chart or the admittance Smith chart. So well, I, I actually can get myself away. All right, so now let's do the same thing. Again, we go off and say uh, y, we're going to normalize y is equal to y over y0. y0 is going to be 1 over 50 ohms or 0.02 mohs. Okay, so you measure, uh, in, you measure admittance in terms of a moh which is not a Three Stooges thing, it's, it's ohm spelled backwards, okay? 
Okay, so that's how they measure it. Okay, so 50 ohms is 0.02 moles. All right, and that's going to have a real part J plus JB. Again, now you can see that just because Y is 1 over Z, this formula here is flipped upside down, like that. Okay, so you see that's flipped upside down. You can do the same thing. You can get the, the, the G, the trace of G is a function of U and V, where, U and, where this is the real and imaginary part of the reflection coefficient. And you can also do the same thing for B. And you can look at, say, X, the circles again. Okay, so they look like circles. This is where my computer fails me. Ah, it doesn't work. As you can see, now the circles, though, sit on this side of the plane. They don't sit over here like this. They sit, the, these, the circles that, that increase, they go this way, on this side. So basically, it's the mirror image of this guy. It's just the reflection. It's one over is the reflection of that guy. Now, this didn't come out on my slides, and I'll have to fix that on my new fancy new computer. But basically, this is B equals 1. This is B equals minus 1. That's the same as these blue guys here. Okay, but they didn't show up here. So, for... So impedance and emittance Smith charts. For matching a network that contains elements connected in series, we'll need two Smith charts, an impedance Smith chart and an emittance Smith chart. Now you're simply saying, well, oh, this is getting annoying. Okay, let's just use a computer at this point, because this is just ridiculous. I don't want to have two charts. However, one way to think about this is that the emittance Smith chart is just the inversion of the other guy. It's one over. And one over is just flip is the same as just flipping the vector by 180 degrees. Okay, you can convince yourself of that in your leisure, but it's, it's pretty amazing. So the emittance Smith chart is just the impedance Smith chart just rotated 180 degrees. So you can take the same Smith chart and just twist it like that, and it works the same way. All right. You could do that, but instead of flipping your Smith, and sometimes I do this, I just start taking the Smith chart and I flip it back and forth and I get lost. A lot of times what I do is, another way to do it is just flip the reflection coefficient and keep track of what I'm doing. So instead of, you know, it's a, it's a reference point. Instead of turning the piece of paper, turn myself on the piece of paper, okay? And you can get away with it. This is kind of like a ballet. You'll have to get used to doing this. And the first time you do it, it'll just seem like complete magic in how it works. But we'll go through an example. Okay, here's an example. Given y is equal to 1 plus j1, what is gamma? Okay? So what we would do is we would leave our Smith chart this way. We just leave it like this. We would plot 1 plus j1 on the Smith chart. Here is, here is 1, 1, right there. We plot that. Even though we're on the impedance Smith chart, we just plotted the impedance equals 1 plus 1. But we're going to tell ourselves we're, it's, the Smith chart is fine. We're just upside down. Okay. So now what we'll do is we'll flip the vector 180 degrees, and then we'll read the reflection coefficient of, we can read it here, it's got a length of 0.45, and its angle is minus 160 degrees. Okay. So that's the reflection coefficient for 1 plus 1. So you leave the Smith chart the way it is, you plot the impedance, and then you flip. Okay. So you've got to keep a little cheat sheet going, saying, where, uh, where am I at? Now, uh, let's see. Let's try this another way. Given the reflection coefficient is 0.5, angle 45 degrees, and Z0 is 50 ohms, what is Y? Okay, plot gamma. So you plot it here. It's 0.5, angle 45 degrees. That now flip by 180 degrees. Read the co coordinate. It's 0.38 minus 0.36, and you write that down. And you write multi You normalize it by 1 over 50 ohms, and you get your value of y. Okay. So it takes a little bit of going back and forth to do this. Okay. So it's just that the emittance and impedance are inverses of each other. So you get to flip back and forth on top of the Smith chart. So, you know, you're multiplying by 1 over 50 ohms. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what you try to do is you try to sit there and do the operations always the same, but do the 1 overs at the end. Okay. So, here's a matching example uh, Z equals 50 ohms. Uh, our load, Z0 is 50 ohms, and our load is, is 100 ohms. And we would like to make it right here. We'd like to have the generator see and sit there and say, this needs to be a, um, we want this to be look like 50 ohms at our frequency of 100 megahertz. So at 100 megahertz, we want to do this. We can't do this at all frequencies. We can only do it at one, at one specific frequency. 
So 100, resistor, 100 ohm resistor in parallel would do the trick, but half the power would go in that resistor. And that would work for all frequencies. So that's a nice thing to do. So for example, um, it used to be that uh, like laser diodes have a very low impedance, like 1 ohm. And you would want to actually match into them. Basically, you put a 49 ohm, in, ohm resistor in parallel, and then you have this huge hit in signal to noise. So you basically have a resistive divider of 1 ohm, 49. And so basically, that's like a 30 dB drop in the signal. So that was, you just had to live with that kind of stuff to get the broadband match. But we're gonna, we don't need to do this. We have a klystron in the back end here, so we want to do something different. Okay. So let's just do only lossless devices. So the first thing to do is plot, is to sit there and look at the Smith chart as kind of our map on where we're going to go. So we need to go from z equals 2 to z equals 1 on the Smith chart. And I'm going to plot it, what it is. Here is, here is the real circle equal to 1. Here's the imaginary value equal to 0. And here it is, is this is the real circle equal to 2. So basically right here, this is the reflection coefficient. So I'm sitting right here. This is the length of my reflection coefficient. And I want to make that reflection coefficient go to 0. Okay? Now, so if we add something in series, we're going to add, try to, we can only use imaginary components, right? We can't use any, we can't, imaginary, I mean, inductors or capacitors. Okay, so you do that, you're sitting here, you can only go this direction or that direction. You've got to keep the real value constant. You can't put any real impedance in there. You can't sit there and say, oh, I'll just get myself over here. That means you've got to put real impedance into that thing. Okay, and that's going to increase loss. So the only thing you could do by adding something in, in series with this thing is you can go in this direction or you go in that direction. And both those guys are going the wrong way. So right away you tell yourself, this is not going to do me any good. I need to start off by adding something in parallel first, so something in series. So this is the first thing the Smith chart tells you, okay? It's like saying, hey, sorry, you got to go add something in parallel first. And you wouldn't get that unless your computer was just, you know, your computer program could be very smart. But you won't see that intuitively. And the Smith chart says, hey, you got it. you're over here, you got to add something in parallel. So, okay, we will now add something in parallel. To add something in parallel, we're going to flip this guy over and say we're on the Mitten Smith chart. We need to keep a mental note. We're on the Impedance Smith chart now, and now we're going to flip over and we're going to go on to the Admittance Smith chart. To do that, I could flip the Smith chart over, or I could just flip this vector over. I choose to flip the vector over, and now you see that y is equal to 50.5 plus j0. Duh. If the other one was 2, this is one's got to be 0.5, so this is an easy one. And you can see now, um, right now, is that we can actually, by going this way or this way, we do get closer to where we want to go. But before we, before we add any more mittens, we need to have some guideposts on where to go. How far should we go? So a nice guidepost to put in is this real r equals 1 circle. Okay, it's the mirror of this guy. Because we're flipping back and forth on the Smith chart, we need to have something to help us on our flips. So here, we're just going to put the mirror of this guy in here. So I'm just going to add this little guide in here. So the first thing you do on a Smith chart, you always add a little guide circle on it. Okay, but to me, they should just have those on there. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add some positive imaginary admittance. So we're going to go this direction here. And the amount we're going to go to is we're going to go until we hit this, uh, this guide circle. So we go up here until we hit this guide circle, and this is how much we're going to add. We have to add in 0.5 uh, J imaginary to get to here. And what is that? 0.5 J imaginary, you, you normalize it, multiply it by 1 over 50 ohms, and that's equal to 2 pi 100 megahertz C, and that turns out that you need 16 puffs. So 16 puffs would get you from here to there. So basically, this circuit here of 100 ohms, 16 puffs, you have a reflection coefficient here on the admittance Smith chart. On the impedance Smith chart, it's over here. All right. Now, we're sitting there saying we've done enough as far as in parallel as we can do. Next thing we need to do is go back to the series, is to add something in series. So since we're in the admittance Smith chart, we're already flipped, let's flip back. So let's, let's go back and flip. So now when we do the flip, the reflection coefficient, which was here on the emittance Smith chart, flips over to here on the impedance Smith chart. Right? And it landed magically on the real equals one circle. Okay, when it landed here on the real equals one circle, great. 
Now if I add imaginary impedance, it can either go this way, or lo and behold, it can go this way. And I add enough to get me up to here. Okay. And so the amount that I add would be, um, the amount that I would add would be, that I need to add would be actually 1.0. These numbers turned out very nicely. I need to add J1.0 impedance onto this, which turns out to be 80 nanohenries. So this would be my matching circuit. Here's 100 ohm, 16 puffs in parallel, 80 nanohenries in series, and basically I get matched right at the thing. Looks incredibly magical, okay, that this actually works. All right, and okay, but it works, but it only works at one frequency. Now, we also could have done this solution here. We could have, instead of going this direction, we could have gone down. So we would have added an inductor in series, okay, and then we'd flip, and then we'd add a capacitor, in, an inductor in parallel, a capacitor in series, okay, like this. And so you have two different solutions. So typically, given the number of combinations, you get two different solutions. If I wanted to use three elements, I would get three solutions. Right. Now, you have to ask yourself which solution is better. It depends on what you're building. If this guy here, I wanted to put a DC bias voltage across this guy here, this is a bit of a problem because I got a, short, a DC short circuit over here. Whereas the other guy, um, oops. Here, I could put a DC voltage across this thing and bias it up if it was some kind of transistor. I could put a bias voltage up here. So you, it's kind of nice, you kind of pick your topology. And this is what's nice about a smith chart. You can look at this and say, geez, I only want to use a capacitor in parallel. I only want to use inductors in series. And you can kind of sit there and say, you kind of, kind of know which way to go. All right, now, if you take a look at this and you just did this, we matched only at 100 megahertz. This would be the reflection coefficient in dB as a function of frequency. And you can see right at the notch, boom, it just drops like a rock. So the reflection coefficient gets very, very low. Okay, so here is the trajectory of the reflection coefficient as a function of frequency on the Smith chart. It goes, it starts off here at low frequency, 100 megahertz, it's matched, and it goes off like that. And you'll see this a lot in the lab when we do this. Okay, now. Here goes dB and dB again, dBm again. So this is good because you'll be going to the lab. dB is defined as a power ratio. It started with sound, right? How much pow sound power you can hear, all right? But it's a power ratio. And it's given the ratio of, for example, the reflection coefficient is given as the ratio of the reverse power over the forward power. That's the reflection coefficient in dB. So always remember that dB is a power ratio in any field of physics. No matter what you're doing, it's always a power ratio. All right. However, um, remember that the reflection code, so it's, and so this ratio here is 10 log gamma squared. But you can pull the two out and it's 20 log gamma. And this is what confuses the heck out of people, is because gamma is a ratio of voltages. So it's 20 log, so you say, so people go, is that dB volts or is that dB power? always dB power, but if you know your impedance system, the impedance of your system is constant, it's not moving around, you can pull that out and you can get 20 log on that quickly. So, so basically, we'll, we'll, we could do these very quickly in terms, of, in terms of either voltage or power ratio. So if you give me a ratio, a voltage ratio of 10 to 1, okay, I'll sit there and say that's 20 dB, right? If you give me a, 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 a power ratio of 10 to 1, it's 10 dB, okay, because I, I just remember these things. And by the time you get done with this lab, you'll have these things down. I'd recommend actually writing down what um, uh, 20 dB is, 30 dB is, minus 20, 30 dB is, in terms of what the real ratio is, until you get the hang of it. You can just write it down like on a little side of a piece of scrap paper. Now, it's a ratio. A dB is a ratio. But sooner or later, you sometimes you want to have an absolute value of power. So a watt is an absolute value of power. So a unit of power you can go into, but we might talk about, for example, in the stochastic cooling systems Ralph talked about, we would start off with picowatts and end up with kilowatts, right? That's 15 orders of magnitude difference. And so that's kind of hard to be writing those zeros around. That's why God invented logarithms for engineers. And so, that, so what you can do is then you can define power ratio as power referred to one milliwatt. 
and that's called the dBm. It's a dB relative to one milliwatt. It's a dBm. So on your spectrum analyzers, you're always going to be measuring dBm's as the absolute value, but when you want to compare two powers, you'll sit there and say the ratio between these two powers is in dB. So if you want to talk about one power value, it's in dBm. If you want to talk about two power values, you talk about the ratio, it's in dB. It'll take a little bit before you get there. Okay, so a single step tuner um, is, um, so, um, I've already screwed in those connectors already. Okay, so, all right, here, so now, Inductors and capacitors are fine, but that doesn't really work well in like very high frequency. So if you're if you're up in C band or X band or something like this, trying to get a hold of an inductor or a capacitor is not going to be very easy to do that. Sorry, right? like if you want to go up to Slack and they're at C band, you're going to have a little bit of a problem with inductors and capacitors at that point. So what you'd like to do is you'd like to use something that stores energy. Transmission lines can store energy, so you can use that to match. And so a single stub tuner is basically a parallel combination. You have one length off the load, and you have something in parallel. You could do it other ways as well. You can, you, can, you can do other configurations. You could do series stub tuners. The only problem with series stub tuners is they're difficult to realize in the real world because you have to connect the ground of one transmission line to the center conductor of another transmission line. That's hard to do. So basically, it's always better to have a parallel configuration when you have series stub tuners. So now again, we're going to match a 100 ohm load to a 50 ohm system at 100 megahertz using two transmission lines connected in parallel. Okay, so we have a length tau one and a length tau two. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to plot your reflection coefficient here, and if that's the remember it was 100 ohms what went to here, and you remember what we already we already picked the configuration, right? We already picked that there was going to be we're going to put something in parallel. So what we know what we're going to do is we're going to start with this guy and we're going to move away from the load with the transmission line. So this is going to rotate with a circle. And I, I want to remember now, when you do a transmission, when you go with the transmission line, it rotates in a circle centered around the origin, not on the circles of the Smith chart. When you're using lumped elements, they run on the circles of the Smith charts. When you're doing transmission lines, they run on circles centered around the origin. It's a little bit hard to get used to. So now you sit there and say, okay, I'm going to take this guy, and I know I'm going to go into parallel at the end. So if I go into parallel, I'm going to jump to the emittance Smith chart. So basically, I'm going to go to here. I'm going to jump. So I'd like to end up here. So I'm going to rotate my vector all the way until I hit the purple line. And the amount that I need to do is basically I need 251 degrees to do that, which is about 3.5 nanoseconds, okay, to go through here at the 100 megahertz. Now, I'm going to add something in parallel. To do that, I have to flip over to the emittance Smith chart. And so I need to add a normalized emittance of 0.7, uh, uh, 0.7 to get me back up to here. I'm he I, I flipped, I'm here, I need to add 0.7 to add me in there. So I need to take a look at that, that this, this uh, transmission line that's in parallel. Let me go back a little bit. This guy here. Remember, I've taken this guy, I've rotated, my, uh, I've rotated my vector until I get by 250 degrees. Now, this is a black box. It could be a capacitor, it could be an inductor, but I'm just going to use it as a transmission line. And back here, I want to make this look like an emittance of 0.7 on there. So this starts off with open circuit, and I'm going to rotate this thing until it looks like 0.7 at this point, and then I'll connect the two of them together. So, what does an open circuit look like um, in terms of, of uh, an emittance? Well, in terms of an impedance, the open circuit is over here, right? That's where an open circuit is. That's reflection coefficient is plus one. In terms of emittance, I flip it 180 degrees, okay? Now, I start rotating this thing until this guy hits the 0.7 imaginary circle, and I stop, okay? And I needed 0 0.9, 0 0.97 nanoseconds to do that. So I have a length of 0.97 nanoseconds. And so this is my matching, my, my matching network, 3.5 nanoseconds and 0.9 nanoseconds. I took from here, 100 ohms, rotated up to here, went into admittance, and then I added 0.7 in parallel onto that to get me to here. Okay, now you also could have done a short circuit here 
and you could have rotated myself down to here, flipped, and come back down to this way. There's, there's again, there's two different ways you could have done this. I'd recommend that you guys, you know, for fun, just go um, and try this out in your. Okay. Yes. Oh, you want to see that? Yeah. Okay, uh, I understand the the constant radius circle for the first transmission line, and yep. then you added a shunt transmission line. Right. And that's a constant radius circle. So you have to have two Smith charts for this, but you can use them on the same Smith chart. So let me try to show this again here. This is a little complicated. <clears throat> you knew from that other circle that you needed to have that 0.7. Okay, imaginary, which is right here. Okay, and you need to start from an open. So the open has an impedance over here. It flips and becomes uh, an emittance that looks like this. And now you're going to add length on it so it runs as a constant circle on the outside edge. And then you take that and you add it in parallel. Does that make sense? Okay. If it does, you guys are geniuses because this is really takes a little bit to do. Okay, and again, here is the frequency bandwidth. This is very narrow, okay, but you can see right here that it matches there. So if you're working on, uh, yeah. So, how do you plug a blue Oh, how do I do that? I, I, is it, I mean, do you follow the equations in the Every time from one frequency you have to. Or just take the number of points for some of the frequencies? I mean, solve the problem. Well, what I did here is I basically just did an Excel spreadsheet and I made the trajectories, okay. and I and I went ahead and did that. Um, so you'll see this when we when we do the lab uh, on the matching lab. 
you'll do this all at one frequency. You'll have this fancy network analyzer that sweeps from 0 to 26 gigahertz, and you'll sick it at one frequency. And you'll just hold it at one frequency. And you'll do the matching only at one frequency. And then, because you're not going to you can't get the matching done at all the other frequencies, it'll just confuse you. Once you get that done, you'd like to say, well, what's my bandwidth is? Then you'll open up the span, and you'll take a look at it and see how, bad, how broad band it is. Now, if you're, if you're just trying to do RF power, this is good enough. This is great, because this is, you know, you don't care about, you know, if, this, you're, if you're with a Linux, that's your RF system, you're done. You're, you're, you've got this taken care of. For a broadband system, it, you, there's other techniques that we won't go for filter synthesis that we won't go into. But this is a real, real quickly, it, you know, I have done this many times where you're sitting there saying, I need to match this thing just to get the, the power in at one frequency. Literally, you could do this in five minutes. You could, you know, you could, in minutes, you could just push something together. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about, before we go into this, we're going to talk about what, net, how network analyzers work. All right. <coughs> Before, uh, we've only talked about reflection so far, but what about transition? So consider you have a device with two ports. It's got two voltages on either side and has currents going in. So you characterize this by a two by two matrix, which is called the Z matrix. It's, you know, and this is basically, it looks like Ohm's law, but it's a matrix format. V is equal to Z1, I1, v, I won't go right say the words, but basically Z11 is basically the ratio of V1 over I1, assuming this current is zero. So if this was an open circuit, you would put a voltage on here and you would measure the current that goes in there. That's V11. V22 is you put a voltage in here, measure its current, and with this current, you an open circuit in there. So that's how you would do this. And you already realized now that this is almost impossible to do at RF frequencies because you can't really talk about lumped elements. You have to talk about the things on the wavelength. Impedances and admittances change as a function of line length. So now, what people think about is that we talk about S parameters, which are called scattering parameters. So now the thing you're going to think about is instead of this circuit being voltages and currents, that's your low frequency concept, in reality what you're going to think of this is a device that you're going to send waves in and you're going to bounce waves off and you're going to measure what those waves look like. And they do this, for example, in radar ranges in, in Sandia and stuff like this. They would put like little aircrafts and they would, you know, send uh, uh, waves at them and they measure the scattering parameters of, of the airplane or whatever they want to do to minimize the cross section or something like this. So the same thing we're going to do here. We're going to basically put our device in front of a, in front of a network analyzer and we're going to send electromagnetic waves at the device and we're going to bounce all those waves off and that way we're going to be able to characterize the device. So it's a different way of characterizing the device instead of voltages and currents. So you can, you can decompose the voltage and currents in terms of forward voltages and reverse voltages and forward currents and reverse currents. So then you can write the, the, the circuit with forward and reverse waves. That basically you have a reverse wave coming out of port 1, you have an incident wave coming out of port 1, you have an incident wave on port 2, and you have a reverse wave coming out of port 2. So you have two ports. Just think of them. They, can, they don't have to be transmission line, uh, coaxial lines. They could be waveguides. They could be anything. So you're going to send a wave in on port 1. You're going to measure what comes off port 1, but you're also going to measure what gets transmitted into port 2. Okay, that's sending this wave in on port one, you measure what comes out of port two. All right, so, so, so this is called the S matrix, and it's in terms of, uh, on this side are the waves coming out of the ports, and on this side are the waves going into the ports. So, you can write this then, going through this, just doing a little math magical magic, it looks almost exactly like the formula for one, for one port, as you can see here, except it's done with matrices. It's not that people really ever do this, but it's to give you a feel that if you know the S parameters, you know the Z parameters. So when you're measuring these S parameters, you're going, really, what are these things? If you really don't like it that much, you can think of them in terms of voltages and currents if you want to. But it's just another way of looking at it. Okay, so the one thing that people like to do, those were unnormalized. Uh, scattering parameters. They were basically, they, they, they didn't take into account, uh, they were basically ratio of voltages. What we'd like to do is normalize these things. These network analyzers do normalized network, normalized network analyzers. And what you do is you take each one of the waves and you divide it by the square root of the impedance on that side of the port. So, for example, you could have a device that has 50 ohms on one side and 100 ohms on the other side. Okay? When you have that uh, unnormalized scattering matrix, it's a little funny in how that works. 
if they have different characteristic impedances. Here, if you normalize them, then you don't have to worry about that. So by doing this here, then you now come up with the A's and the B's, and this is what you'll typically see on the network analyzer. The A's are the incident waves, the B's are the reflected waves, and the Z0I is the characteristic impedance of the transmission line connecting port I. So the magnitude of AI squared is the forward power to the port I. The magnitude of BI squared is the forward power. So you normalize the Z, you're, normal, you're getting rid of the Z0 effects. And then you have the normalized scattering matrix. B is equal to SA. So you see on these network analyzers, you'll see this thing called B, which is the reflected waves, is equal to the scattering matrix times the incident waves. And then the, the difference between a, a normalized uh, normalized scattering matrix and a normalized scattering matrix is just given by this ratio. Normally, you never even worry about this. This is just for your own academic use. So normalized S parameters are what's most commonly used. So what people do is they draw these things uh, with control theory diagrams. In the old days, when people used to have to do this without computers, they had to use control theory with Mason's rule and all that kind of stuff. And you do Mason's rule once, and you say, thank God for computers, because it really is, is really nasty. So these are control nodes right here, and they have vectors coming in. So you have an A1 going in through here, S21 is the ratio of B2 to A1, given that A2 is equal to zero, okay? And, and S11 is, A1, is B1 over A1, given that A2 is equal to zero, okay? So what you need, so, these, so this is just a, you'll see this on the front of the network analyzers. It's never helped me do anything but confuse the crap out of me, so I would just, just say, forget it, okay? There's, there's no reason to do this, uh, this picture. Okay, some convenient S parameters. A transmission line, okay, from going from port one to port two, if this, if you sit there and, if, if this is a matched transmission line, then, the, then these diagonal terms here should be equal to zero. That means if I terminate port two, so that there's no backwards wave coming back in here, then this guy here should take all my energy and I should see, never see anything back. So these guys here are kind of like the reflection coefficients. S11 and S22 are the reflection, are kind of con considered the reflection coefficients, and these guys here are the transmission coefficients. Okay, and the transmission coefficients is just a phase delay. A short circuit put in here, nothing gets transmitted, so the off diagonal terms are zero, and then you get minus one reflection coefficient here and minus one reflection coefficient here. An amplifier, a good amplifier, would have the reflection coefficients equal to zero. That means they would look matched on both sides. And I could not send the signal backwards. That would be a bad amplifier. A good forward amplifier is to send the signal this direction. A circulator, there's a circulator, oops, I don't want to bring this circulator right there. Circulator is used all the time in, in RF power systems. You'll see this, they're used to protect klystrons. Okay, and so basically a circulator, you send a signal into port one, it goes to port two, but it does not go to port three. You send a signal to port two, it goes to port three, but it does not go to port one. So you see the diagonal terms are zero, and you see this wacky uh, pattern going through here. An isolator, and this is what you use basically to protect klystrons, is that you put a termination on port three. This means that basically I have my klystron here, I send signal in here, it goes from port one to port two, which is my cavity down here. Now when my cavity blows up or does something stupid, um, basically, then the power all reflects here. None of it goes to port one, but it all goes to Z zero, goes to port here, and so I'm protected. Okay, so this is a convenient, this is a nice way to protect it. So you always will go see in the labs, you'll see these circulators. They got three ports, and on one of them is a big resistive load that's not. Okay, so a couple handy things to do when you're doing these network analyzer measurements to remember this is first of all is Lorentz reciprocity. Lorentz reciprocity. If the device is made of linear isotropic materials, resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, metal, things like crystals and stuff like that, maybe not so much because they're not isotropic. Okay, they're linear, but they're not isotropic. If you have that, that means that SJI is equal to SIJ. That means the transmitting pattern is the same as the receiving pattern. So everybody knows this from your antenna. When you transmit out, it's the same as your receiving pattern, and that's given by Lorentz Trespositing. So reciprocal devices, transmission line, um, transmission line is reciprocal, the short is reciprocal, directional coupler is reciprocal, non-reciprocal devices, amplifier, isolator, and circulator. So when you do your cal kits on your network analyzers, you go off and you cal these things, and you have to do these complicated series of measurements. The first thing you want to do is check at the end whether or not you did it right. 
And a lot of times, the first thing I find out is it came up and it's not reciprocal. I go, I know it's reciprocal, therefore I made a mistake. So I test something silly like a, like a through and make sure that it's reciprocal. Okay, that's a, that's a kind of a key thing. Lossless devices. A lossless device is unitary. That means S star transpose times S is equal to 1. That means if I sum up all the rows or I sum up all the columns squared, it's equal to 1. So this is a really nice double check. If you know you have a lossless device, like a transmission line there, you should sit there and take S11 squared plus S21 squared, it should equal to 1. Okay? Or if you have a short circuit or if you have something that has no losses in there, you should either get the rows to sum up or the columns to sum, sum up to 1. And it's a good double check that you did the right answer. So some lossless devices, transmission line, short, a circulator is a lossless device, but it's not reciprocal. Non-lossless devices are amplifiers and isolators. Okay, so the network analyzers. Um, so you're going to get these really fancy boxes here. This is, this, this is they're getting fancier every year. Uh, it measures the S parameters as a function of frequency. So it sweeps the frequency. It does it at, it does it at one frequency, makes a measurement, moves on. Makes another measurement, moves on. And every measurement, it's with respect to the frequency at that point, okay? So now what you're going to do is you're going to send a wave out of this port, and you're going to send a wave out at this port, and you're going to hit your device, and you're going to measure waves coming back into the ports. So you're going to send waves out, and you're going to measure the waves that come back. All right? So they, they do it as they, at a single frequency. They send waves A1 and A2, and then they measure B1 and B2. So S11 is B1 over A1 with A2 equal to 0, and so on. I won't go through all the things like that. So you can picture you have to, this is what we're going to do. So this is what these network analyzers will do. <clears throat> However, when you connect up a network analyzer, you're going to put a cable on it. And we already saw that a cable messes up the reflection coefficient, right? It changes it. Or you might <coughs> have a connector that's got a bad, that's not as perfect. It's not uh, wonderful at all frequencies. So these things are basically, you can draw these things as, here I said I never would ever use the, those control diagrams, but here they are. Here's a control diagram of my device under test, and here's my connector in the front, and here's my connector on the end. I'd like to know the S parameters here, but I measure my S parameters here and here. So I need to get rid of all this junk out here, and I need to figure out what these things are. So the way I do that is I'm going to put some calibrations in between here so that I can measure these guys here and get rid of that stuff. So, there are 10 unknowns, and they need 10 independent measurements. In fact, there's actually 12, and some points there's 16, depending on the models that people use. So, we need to develop calibration standards. So, the thing is, you place your, your, your standards in place of the device under test, the dot, and you measure the S parameters of the standards and the connectors. Because, it, um, because you know when they, they go out and they precisely build these short circuits, they know what its reflection coefficient did there. You put it on that thing, you tell it's a short, it says that's a short. It goes and says, I measure short. You give it an open. You give it a 50 ohm load. And then it says, oh, I'll do this. And it does some fancy math, inverts that thing, and finds the unknowns for that. And then we'll take those unknowns off on all the other measurements. So um, what do these standards look like? There are different types. Here's a through short delay um, that you could, you could do. It's not the best type of thing because this delay is a function of frequency, so it's not the best type of standard to use. All right, and then two more concepts. I noticed in a very long lecture, um, but two more concepts. Um, phase delay and group delay. We're going to ask you things about phase delay and group delay on this thing. So the phase delay, a pure sine wave can be written as V equals V0 e to the J mega T minus beta Z. We already did this. So the phase shift through a cable, you put in of cable of length d, is just equal, beta d is equal to, theta is equal to beta d, right? That's basically equal to, this is going to be the phase shift is omega d over v phase or omega t phase, which we've done that, right? So one thing that I didn't put in the notes, but you should remember, so theta is omega t phase, which is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, times the delay here. And if this is good, then this means that this is in radians, right? If you want to do it in degrees, it's real simple. Three sixty degrees F top. 
is the one another formula you should take out of your heads from here. So the the, the delay of a cable is 360 degrees f tau. Okay, so the phase delay of a device is defined as basically the argument of S21 divided by the frequency. That's the phase delay of the device. So basically, if you're sitting out, out on, the, on the shore of, 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 uh, of the beach, and you don't look at the shore, you just look at one point and you see the waves coming in at you. And just assume that the waves are coming in at an angle, but you don't know that. So the waves are coming in at an angle, but you just are looking straight out on the beach. And you sit there and you count the time between the intervals of the peak. Okay? That's how you measure phase delay. You measure the, the, the difference between the, phase, the, the time the peaks come at you. Okay? That's what phase delay is. So for non, um, okay. so for non dispersive cable, the phase delay is the same for all frequencies. All right? In general, though, the phase delay will be a function of frequency, and it's possible the phase delay will take on a value even greater than the velocity of light. Okay, so the phase, the phase delay of a waveguide can be greater than the velocity of light. And what does that mean? Um, you can actually see this, the one way I do this is I like to sit and sail and things like that. So if you take a look at waves on, coming at you at an angle on the shore, right? So if a waves come ashore, you can see the waves coming like this and you can see the velocity at which those waves are going. That's the energy that's going in there. But if you ever sit there and watch the shore, and just look at the shore when the waves hit an angle, they go, right? They just, all of a sudden you just see that the, the, the kind of wave hits the shore and it goes real quick. So at that point you see that the phase velocity is very slow out on the, the sea, but when it hits the shore, it basically is very quickly. Okay, so that's the difference between group velocity and phase velocity. So in a waveguide, the reason why this happens is in a waveguide, you can't, you can't get a TEM wave to go down the center of that thing, right? Remember we told you because there's no copper to go around. So what happens in a waveguide, it bounces. It goes bink, 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 bink. That's how a waveguide works. It's basically a wave that's just bouncing off the sides. And the angle that it has to make is given how close it is near cutoff. If it goes right near cutoff, then the angle is like 90 degrees, and it never makes it in. It just goes just back and forth. It never makes it in there. If you get above cutoff, it gets bigger and you go choo, choo, like this on it. So that's one reason. And so that now, when you're sitting, that's how the group, that's how the energy is being transmitted down the waveguide. It's bouncing like this down the waveguide. However, you're sitting there on top of it, you're like looking at the waves on the shore. And that looks like the phase velocity of the waveguide is greater than the phase velocity than light. Okay, so what really counts is group delay. A pure sine wave has no information content. Um, so there's nothing changing in a pure sine wave, so information is equivalent to something changing. So you can't tell to do somebody to don't say something like this unless you change something. Throw a switch, do something. So something, it's basic information theory. You have to change something in order to convey information. So to do this, there must be some modulation of the source. Cosine so omega t, and we'll basically sit there and modulate it with this little very slow frequency modulation here. So Ralph talked about this today. We talked about multiplying things. When you multiply it, this, this is the same thing here. You get the sum, and you get the difference frequencies here. So each, each so, so now you think about this. I have this modulated wave. And it basically consists of three frequencies, the carrier and the two sidebands that go through that thing. Okay? And so now each one of those guys are independent waves and they're going to emanate this from the source, and they're going to travel at the velocity of light, or at whatever velocity that they're going to leave at the source at. So this guy here is beta z, this guy here is beta plus delta beta, and this is my, uh, beta plus minus beta. So then I can just rewrite this whole darn thing, and it looks like this. Okay. So the modulation, this is how the wave translates. This is delta omega minus, minus delta beta z, and this is cosine omega t minus beta z. The ratio of omega over beta, that's the phase velocity, right? That's the velocity of the carrier. This guy here is the velocity of the information. So the group, and that's the group velocity, which is 1 over delta beta over delta omega, or 1 over d beta d omega. So basically, that's the group velocity. It's the derivative of it, where the phase velocity is the ratio. 
And if you looked at the group velocity, if the group, group delay is defined as t group is equal to d over v group, then basically going through this thing, the group delay is the derivative of the phase of the transmission coefficient with respect to frequency. It's the slope of the frequency on the trace of the network analyzer. So you're going to do this measurement. You'll measure group delay. You'll measure phase delay um, with these things. And group delay is the slope of the phase. And the, um, and the, uh, the phase velocity is the value of the phase. OK. So there you go. All right. So OK, so that was literally about two semesters worth of, of, engineer, of RF engineering placed at one time. The first time you do the matching of the Smith chart, so today I think we're going to do just mostly the spectrum analyzers. What I recommend that you do tonight is try doing those matching examples, that you can look at how I did it, and try to do it without help, I mean, without looking at the notes. See if you can actually go ahead and, and see if you can do that on your own and get the answers. If you can do that, you, you'll be okay with the lab. lab. You probably won't get it right, but if not, then tomorrow when we do it in the lab, it'll take about 10 times before you get it right and you'll, you'll go ahead and do it. Any questions? So now that fun begins.